How's it going? Patsy and Claire, you're very welcome from um, uh, coming in from Starleaf. It's a tea. Morning. Um, okay, um, how we're, yes, we have the quorum here and we're all seated appropriately. Um, today's meeting will include a briefing from the Permanent Secretary's official on EU uh, exit preparedness, a briefing from the EU exit uh, SL1 and consideration of four SAs. Um, uh, Claire and Patsy are on line with us here and I think uh, John and Morris uh, will be joining as well at some mm -hmm. juncture. Uh, the, as we know previously, the committee will be broadcast, recorded and broadcast through part of buildings and online. And you can use your um, mobile devices provided they're muted and an airplane mode. Um, we don't have any apologies and I want to advise members that, that I have been invited to chair the committee to Trade and Agricultural Commission's Virtual Evidence Gathering Roundtable on the 23rd of November 2020. I want to refer members to the note of the informal meeting with Grassroots Mountain Bikes on the 20th of October. And, uh, and are members okay to note that there? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, I want to invite members that following oral evidence session with the ports, we agreed to write to the Scottish Committee for Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs and has been considering, as it has been considering the issue of ports and the protocol. We've now heard back from the convener of the committee who has suggested an informal a uh, virtual meeting and uh, they have been in contact with Michael Gove and have received correspondence from him on the matter of the Scottish Ports. Um, um, are members okay to um, the, the, the we meet with the Scottish convener and the deputy convener to discuss further? Okay, okay um, the draft minutes, uh, the the meeting held on the 22nd of October, page 7 of 13. Are we okay for me to sign these draft minutes? Yes. <coughs> Done. And uh, anybody, any matters want an erasion from it? Draft minutes? Okay, well, we're moving on to item 5 on the agenda, which is an oral briefing uh, from the, the DERA Permanent Secretary on EU exit preparedness. Um, there's a written briefing uh, at page 16 and 17 in your pack. At 18 to 20, there's a, another briefing on operational readiness. 21 to 26, there's another uh, written briefing on preparation and delivery. There's correspondence from George Eustace to Lord Teverson. And we met Lord Teverson, uh, you recall, uh, some uh, weeks ago on the agri food and the protocol. There's a hundred of the meeting on the 8th of October, that's at page 37 and 49. And the draft SA for the definition of qualifying goods is at page 50-52. So at this uh, juncture, I'd like to welcome Dr. Dennis McMahon, the Permanent Secretary of DERA, Robert Huey, the Head of Veterinary Service and Animal Health, and Norman Fulton, the Head of Food and Farming. And uh, via, via Starleaf, we have Mark Livingston uh, of the Grade 5 Brexit Constituency Planning Branch. So, Mark, you're very welcome as well. And so, and I'd like to invite you uh, and indeed your officials to commence the briefing and then uh, we'll have some questions following that briefing. Thank, yes. thank you very much, <coughs> Chair. Um, on the uh, 24th of September, uh, my colleagues and I provided a verbal update on the sanitary and phytosanitary or SPS operational delivery programme. Um, it's my intention with your agreement to provide a further update on that element of the transition programme today and to address any questions you may have. In doing so, I recognise that colleagues have been providing you with a lot of evidence on various other aspects of this work and that, you've, that you're faced with a huge amount of work resulting from the legislative programme, as indeed is the department. Transition represents an unprecedented programme of work, uh, both in scale and complexity. So I'm very conscious of the pressures that it places on the ERA committee and would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your challenge and support. Before taking you through the operational delivery programme, I'd like to address some of the other issues you've raised. Um, with regard to the preparations for a possible no-trade deal, it's difficult to be definitive without knowing the specific circumstances that might apply in that situation. A key impact would be the application of tariffs on goods moving in both directions between the UK and the EU, and understanding how that will affect markets and trade flows. While the Northern Ireland Protocol would continue in law, the additional complexities that would arise from a no-trade-deal a no trade deal scenario would undoubtedly lead to disruption, particularly for the agri-food industry, where tariff and non-tariff barriers tend to be greatest. 
Clearly, from a DERA perspective, no trade deal is not an outcome we would welcome, but we are planning for every eventuality as far as we can. With regard to the Internal Market Bill, <clears throat> the House of Lords Committee second sitting took place on the 28th of October 2020. Discussions involved consumer and environmental protection, the protocol and common frameworks. The bill is provisionally due to pass to report stage on 16th of November 2020. Uh, you'd also asked about unfettered access. Normal will be happy to provide you with a more detailed position during questions. Again, this is a very challenging issue. We're seeking to find the right balance between ensuring Northern Ireland businesses have full and unfettered access to the GB market while avoiding unintended consequences. Agri-food products moving from Northern Ireland to GB uh, for onward travel to the EU will in some cases need to be accompanied by additional supporting health documentation. These health attestations, or SHAs as they are known, are required to provide the additional information that will allow the completion of a final export health certificate at the point of dispatch in GB. So DARA officials have recently carried out a targeted survey with key business, food business operators to estimate the possible extent of this trade, and the results of this are being used to develop an operational delivery model. So again, we can come back to any of these as, as we get to the questions. We're also arranging communications with a wider range of businesses and relevant stakeholder organisations in the coming weeks. Although I should also say that we've maintained constant contact, contact with industry representatives throughout this process. On operational delivery, <clears throat> it's, it's always useful to begin by reminding ourselves of the basis for the programme. The, legisl the legislative basis for the SPS operational delivery programme is in the EU officials, Official Controls Regulation, or OCR. The requirements as set out in the OCR apply directly to Northern Ireland as a result of Article 5.4 of the Northern Ireland Protocol and Section 7A of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Under the OCR, DARA is responsible for sanitary and phytosanitary checks on certain goods coming into Northern Ireland. So I think I've said before, a range of issues from the beginning have had the potential to derail this work, um, the work schedule necessary to meet the OCR requirements. For example, physical constraints at the site uh, the sites, IT issues, the response to the market and transport considerations. Even without these kinds of issues, the deadline was almost impossible. I therefore would like to pay tribute to my dear colleagues and to those in other government departments, including the Department of Finance and within that the Construction and Procurement Directorate, who, who continue to work extremely long hours to meet these significant demands. It remains the case, however, that for reasons outside the control of DARA, none of us has been granted the time necessary to reflect fully the outcome of the negotiations or to take forward this complex programme in the way we would need to. The committee will recall that we began this programme on a red-amber basis, which indicated the strong likelihood of failure to meet the challenging deadlines due to the lack of clarity on key matters which are central to the success of the programme. The Minister, Minister has always been strongly opposed to additional checks and requirements on goods moving within the UK internal market. However, he's also acknowledged the commitments in the protocol and the need to ensure the goods legally enter Northern Ireland on the 1st of January. Furthermore, it's his position that the implementation of the protocol must minimise frictions on the flow of agri-food trade and work for our businesses and consumers, and I know there's been comments by the Minister this week on that as well. The Minister's position in terms of minimising frictions is shared by the UK Government as set out in its command paper published on the 20th of May 2020. These and other matters of UK and EU policy continue to be addressed through our colleagues in DEFRA, and notwithstanding the lack of clarity in the wider political negotiation landscape, Work has continued at pace since we last updated you, so I want to talk you through that. At this point, I'd like to provide you with an overview of the plans and to how the processes will work. It's important to say that successfully implementing these plans will depend on agreements between the UK Government and the EU. We still lack clarity, as I've said, on the negotiation on some key issues, such as how mixed consignments, so say by retail consignments, for direct sale to the end consumer will be addressed. We have therefore had to make some very significant assumptions. That is the nature of the space that we are in. The unknowns are such that we cannot be ready for all eventualities. So we will do our best to prepare for delivery on day one and we'll adjust our plans if others are unable to deliver what we need. We just decided to go ahead and do that. There are three key elements in our plans to deliver fully functioning points of entry. Specifically, one, the arrangements necessary to undertake documentary and ID checks. Uh, short, for shorthand, I'll use ID checks for SPS goods entering Northern Ireland. Two, the substantive plans for facilities, which will be necessary in order to take physical checks. And three, 
contingency plans for the purposes of covering any gap in arrangements between the 1st of January 2021 and the implementation of the full solution. So I'll take you through all of those points. Whatever model is implemented under the OCR, full documentary and ID checks will be required on all sanitary and phytosanitary eligible consignments. This in turn means that two elements need to be in place ahead of the 1st of January 2021. Namely, first, we will need SPS certificates to be completed in GB. This is a really important point. In order to do this, the UK Government will need to ensure that there are enough vets and other appropriately qualified and trained staff in place to issue the certificates and the businesses in GB are fully prepared to undertake the necessary processes. DERA does not currently have visibility of the plans. We have obviously we have constant conversations with DEFRA, but we do not have uh, visibility of the plans that DEFRA intends to put in place to deliver this essential elements of the process. The certificates will need to be entered into an appropriate IT system, connecting with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, HMRC, and the EU's SPS control system, Traces NT. DERA is working with DEFRA technical teams on a solution allowing access to official certificates held in the DEFRA Export Health Certificate Online or ECHO system. And this work is pro progressing with access to export health certificates on track for day one, followed by phytosanitary certificates. Second, we're planning that documentary checks will be carried out electronically as far as possible and carried out online using Traces NT integrated with the bespoke IT, ICT system. Staff authorised by DERA will carry out the, do the documentary check remotely. Plans are also being formulated for ID checks for SPS consignments. Robert will talk you through this in more detail, but essentially these are to be undertaken either by DERA authorised staff or by other official bodies organised by DERA, authorised by DERA. ID checks for these consignments will be carried out through visual verification of a seal on the shipping unit. This will have been applied under the supervision of the competent authority in GB. If necessary, DERA authorised staff will be located at Cairn Ryan, Liverpool and Haitian to carry out these checks. So this is to avoid, as far as possible, having to stop lorries coming off the ferry, do the work while they're waiting to get on the ferry. This leaves the need for a percentage of consignments to undergo physical checks. Physical checks would therefore be the remaining element and would be provided in Northern Ireland. Hopefully this aspect of the checking will be confined to non-retail um, consignments, but again, these are all matters for discussion. One of the most significant aspects of the programme has been the need to identify suitable site locations for point of entry facilities. As you're aware from my last briefing, specific sites have been identified at Larne, Belfast, Warren Point and Foyle. The programme team remains in negotiations with the ports through Land and Property Services and DSO Commercial to secure the relevant lease agreements. There are, however, some major assumptions built into our plans. Take, for example, consignments of goods for sale to the end consumer. We're planning on the basis of no physical checks recognising that the low level of risks associated with retailer consignments and the processes that will be undertaken in GB before, before boarding the ferries. I want to be very clear, however, that this is still subject to final agreement between the UK and the EU. If facilitations are agreed for these consignments, this will reduce substantially the overall volume of physical checks, checks that will still need to be undertaken on other SPS consignments, again based on risk. But whatever model we are ultimately required to implement, we will need enough facilities, staff and equipment in place to support it. So, contracts have been awarded to John Graham Construction Limited for Larne Harbour, Felix O'Hare & Co Limited for Belfast Harbour and CTS Projects Limited for Warren Point Harbour on the 7th of October 2020. The contractors have been asked to deliver designs and schedules by the 16th of no November 2020, but ov obviously this will be followed up by a process of further discussion. Completion dates cannot be confirmed until that time, although it is clear that full facilities will not be in place by January 2021. It is also worth noting that the time taken to draw up schedules has been affected by the fact that we have diverted the contractors to the development of contingency plans, and I'll come to that in a moment. Before moving on from the full plans, it's worth touching on planning consents. It's DARA's opinion that our proposals fall within permitted development. And I, I should say, I'm giving you a detailed briefing today. This is right up to date. So this is actually moving day by day. And I wanted to make sure I give you, so apologies if I'm giving you a bit much detail. And we'll happily follow up in writing. But I do think it's important that you hear all the facts on this. 
Applications for the proposed Certificates of Lawful Use or Development were submitted to the relevant councils on 15 September 2020. This ensures that the councils determine the technical planning aspects for accuracy, but also ensures that there are no adverse environmental impacts from the proposed facilities. We have received a formal decision from Belfast City Council indicating that they agree with our determination that the facilities planned for Belfast Port are considered permitted development. We also have notifications that FOIL and LAN ports have, have also been agreed and are awaiting certificates, but obviously until we have the certificates, we don't have the certificates. We are also waiting for a Warren Point Council decision, which we would expect shortly. Um, and again, I will update you on that. One of the things we will have to look at now as we develop contingency arrangements is what planning uh, certificates are required there. But uh, again, that's, that's, that will not stop our work. It could not it couldn't stop our work at this stage, given what we have to do. On our contingency plans, the achievable product for the 1st of January 2021 will require some rationalisation of designs, designations rather. We will not be able to approve facilities to handle every type of product at every port on day one. Even within that, there will be a risk of significant delays in clearing consignments, and we will need facilitations from the EU working with the UK Government to mitigate that risk. Robert will be happy to cover that issue during the questions session. Again, our contingency arrangements will be based on a number of assumptions, specifically documentary checks to be completed electronically and ID checks carried out at GB ports immediately prior to sailing. Container units, which will require physical checks, will be notified of this before they arrive in Northern Ireland. And they will typically amount to between two and four <coughs> roll-on, roll-off vehicles per sailing. There are also some detailed, more detailed arrangements planned in terms of unaccompanied freight, and we are considering those at the minute. The key contingency arrangements are as follows. In Larne, the existing facilities and space at Redlands Road will be utilised for live animal checks with the addition of some modular builds. We also intend to repurpose an existing shed in Larne Port, building temporary facilities inside that shed to allow physical inspections to take place. Office accommodation for additional staff required has been provided for re by rent from the harbour. In Belfast, three sites have been identified for physical checks, including existing facilities at Corrie Place and Dufferin Shed. The project team is working well with Belfast City Council team and the harbour authorities. At Warren Point, an external area within the harbour has been identified. A temporary product inspection facility can be constructed at this site. At Foyle, no new infrastructure is proposed, and DERA has an existing structure utilised by the DERA Fisheries team, and this will be fitted with um, temporary inspection equipment and utilised until new modular build is in place. Detailed arrangements are being put in place with the contractors on contingency, and it is our intention to have these finalised very soon. In summary, our current assessment is that the full build programme could take to June 2021 to complete. I have to caveat that by saying this depends on what comes out of the detailed schedule discussions with the contractors that we're having at the minute. Um, and we have continued to, to develop proposals on the end-to-end -end process on IT and on people and work streams. We're now very clear on the delivery pathway for the IT provision, and we will have this in place on the 1st of January 2021. And if anything <coughs> happens to change that position, I will let you know. Recruitment exercises and bespoke training for the portal official vets and inspectors are in place and will continue over the next eight weeks. However, the challenging time frame means we are we're actively looking at redeployment of existing people. So, my message to you today is that we have continued to work very hard since I last briefed you. It has taken intensive and consistent work to get to where we are today. Hopefully, I have given you some assurance that we are putting everything into this programme. We now need the UK Government with the EU together to step up so that we can make this work. In the meantime, thank you again for having us here and we'll be very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank, you. thank you, Dennis, uh, for a very um, detailed and, and comprehensive briefing, of course, which was supported by uh, a written briefing provided to us um, ahead of the meeting. Um, I suppose uh, there are a number of members have indicated they want to ask questions, but maybe I'll, uh, I'll kick off. 
I suppose, uh, Dennis, from the, uh, the briefing provided by the Department, uh, you, you have identified it as a, a major emergency resp response plan. Uh, now that that is a uh, very um, so that's, that's very stark language. A major major emergency response plan. I suppose um, you know what, what could you could you elaborate elaborate, elaborate a, a little bit more on this here because you know obviously it's designated as a major emergency, um, and you're telling us that the full build program won't be completed until June 2021. So I suppose the burning <coughs> question is, come January, you know. Will will the necessary facilities be in place so that to enable the free flow of, of goods uh, east and west? Because that's crucial. Because as you know from um, your own experience and from uh, the market, that the British market is absolutely essential here for our <coughs> So, well, what's your what's your projection? You know, if, if the full if the full build isn't going to be in ready into June 2021, the department have identified this as an emergency emergency. What's your assessment of what may or may not happen on the 1st of January? So there, there's, there's, there's three elements to that. So maybe just um, if I could unpack them, unpack them a wee bit. So we'll talk about the major emergency response plan first. And then I'll talk, what we'll do is talk a little bit about um, the movement of goods from here to GB. Because in physical terms, that's an easier issue. And then we'll talk a little bit about the contingency arrangements here. So first of all, I suppose, in terms of the major emergency response plan, it's worth explaining. We have actually activated that a number of times in, uh, in recent years. And we actually activated it before some of the no deal um, you know, uh, deadlines that occurred last year. And really, the, there, there are, it's, it's worth saying also that there are two reasons for activating the plan. One of those is, indeed, that we want to make sure we're, we're operationally ready for Brexit. But the other one is, of course, COVID. So um, what happens typically when we decide to activate the plan? We decide because we, we, really, we realise that we're moving into a much more operational phase. And what it does is it provides absolute clarity. So we have a gold command that just met this morning, for example, structure. And what we do at that is we basically prioritise those things that absolutely must be done operationally to, 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 keep, us, to keep us afloat. Um, so it's nothing more or less than what it says, but it's really about clear communications and it's about clear prioritisation. And that's why we've activated it. Um, as I say, it, it, <coughs> I'm being honest, I'd love to say that there's a, a lovely preset set of criteria, but typically it's when the top management team in the department feel that at a certain point that, you know what, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of operational issues which need to be dealt with now or very soon, and what we need to do now is just get ourselves into that mode. The second thing then I think is about GB to, to uh, or Northern Ireland to GB movements. And we're looking at a very different set of challenges there. Now Norman will talk about that in, in a minute in terms of the questions, um, but uh, the challenge there is about how we get the right uh, how the right um, arrangements are put in place which ensure that Northern Ireland businesses have absolutely free access and unfettered access while at the same time preventing a situation that they're undercut by other products uh, coming in from across Europe. So there's something about getting the rules right and that's the challenge there and that's more of a policy challenge at the minute. It's a policy challenge for DEFRA um, and we're, we're uh, obviously, aiming, we're trying to input into that all the time, but that is the nature of that challenge, rather than a physical infrastructure uh, issue there. So we would not see ourselves, I can't see any scenario, and Robert can correct me when he speaks in a minute, but I can't see any scenario at this time where we would be necessarily stopping products, for example, from going to GP, uh, GB. There's nothing uh, in, that, in that sense. Uh, the issue around controls will be more at the GB side. Now then, that brings us to the contingency arrangements. So I suppose um, what will happen on day one, the interesting thing is there is an issue about a percentage of physical checks having to happen and having to have those facilities in place to be able to do that. But actually that is going to be one way or the other, that is going to be the minority of consignments. It's not going to be the majority of, of, of uh, consignments will come through without being stopped on the, on the basis I've just talked about. So there'll be a, a seal check done at the port before they leave, and then uh, onto, the, onto the ferry, 
and then this end, we would not be stopping you know, most of those lorries. Some of them would get an indication we need to do, we've been selected for a percentage physical check. The point here is that the, the real challenge here will be ensuring that the certificates are in place to do that. So we need to make sure, um, as far as we can, or businesses need to make sure, and DEFRA need to make sure that those certificates are ready. Because when they come across to us, unless we have a certificate, we have nothing to approve. So I think maybe it might be helpful for Robert to touch up, uh, to maybe uh, elaborate on any of those contingency arrangements. Um, but hopefully, uh, what I would like to say is, we have, before I hand over, one of the important points is we have got, you'll have heard me list, the physical sites that we've got. So we have got places where we can do these checks. Uh, but the challenge is how many of them will there be and will the documentation be right? Because if the documentation isn't right, they don't even get to that point. So Robert, over to you. So the question is, um, will we be able to deliver a full service on, on day one? First place we have to start with that is it depends on the outcome of negotiations. So we will probably know more in a fortnight. As Dennis said, we're preparing for a range of scenarios. Um, but we will not be able to deliver the frictionless movement that we all hoped for, for movement between GB and Northern Ireland on day one. But what we will be able to do is to ensure that physical checks are carried out to a level which allows product to enter Northern Ireland, albeit on some occasions with delays. So we have done what we can to try and minimise talking with the Commission, uh, working with GB, uh, with DEFRA and, and, and others, in order to try and ensure that a plan is in place that minimises uh, the, the imposition on importers uh, as much as we can. So the documentary check piece will be done mainly electronically, will be done almost entirely electronically online um, by uh, admin staff in, in, in Larne, actually, is where they're going to be positioned. And a lot of those checks will be done before the consignment ever leaves the port in GB. The identity checks that have to be done will be done largely by a check of the seal. In order for that to work, the seal is ha has to be put onto the container by an official uh, in GB. Um, and if that's done, then that allows us to do a check at, at the port in GB. And that and that's actually a sensible place for doing it because if there's any non-compliance, it means that container just doesn't move away from the port and then doesn't have difficulties when it comes to Northern Ireland. So we can clear it from an identity check mm. to allow free flow then of, of, of goods through the ports in Northern Ireland. The physical check is the difficulty. Um, the number of physical checks very difficult to calculate because we don't know what the legislation is going to say. <coughs> we don't know what um, tariffs and other things might uh, affect the, fr the flow of, of trade. Will trade be diverted elsewhere? We don't know what preparations the supermarkets are going to make and what changes they're going to make to their, to their normal logistic chains. So a lot of unknowns. We're planning on the assumption that um, of the consignments that arrive into Northern Ireland, products of animal origin, high risk products of, of animal origin, not of animal origin, that we will need to check um, in each of the ports two to four uh, per, per sailing. And we can do that. Uh, that, that. That can be delivered with this interim inter infrastructure. But just to, we'll have to, as Dennis said, we'll have to rationalise our designations. So we're hoping that livestock, for example, cattle, sheep and pigs could come in through both Larne and Belfast. Uh, we won't be able to do that. We don't, won't have a facility in Belfast for, for livestock. We'll only have one in Larne, and that's only uh, an indication of the rationalisation of designations that we'll have to do. So there'll be, a, a, there'll be um, products that will only be able to come through a limited number of points of entry. There will be a limitation on the speed with which we can clear consignments through their physical check. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm convinced that, uh, that the plans, and we'll have detailed plans uh, by Friday of, of what these facilities are actually going to look like, um, will, will deliver and will deliver sufficient capacity to allow trade to continue. Okay. Another point that was mentioned there too uh, in your world and in the uh, written was the possibility of having to redeploy staff. I know there's a recruitment process ongoing, but obviously 
you be more familiar than we would be of the pressure within the department in terms of your TB and your rural development program and um, all of the other. There's, there's an upcoming rural policy. Uh, you know, you you be, be more than aware of the challenges in the department. What potential impact could the re redeployment of staff have for the implementation of all of the other programs within the department, Dennis? Well, I think one, I'll hand over to Robert because most of this is actually on Robert's side at the minute in the sense that um, although there, there are some admin people that Robert referred to. Um, so there's, there's a, it's a case of moving people o over for a period of time while we build up the capacity. Um, and the specific impacts Robert can talk about, but you're absolutely right. The fundamental point is uh, we have a real issue in terms of resources. We have increased the size of the department, and it's been a struggle to get that. Um, I, I mean, to be honest, not, not all for negative reasons, actually, because one of the, one of the things we find is um, a lot of our people are quite employable, and um, you know, the, you'll see them getting uh, poached. Um, but uh, sorry, maybe I shouldn't have used that word. But anyway, uh, but the point being that uh, it's, it, we have we we are still not at the capacity we would need to be. Um, we have increased our numbers from about 3,900 to about 3,200 at this point in time. I can give you the exact figures, um, if, you know, and they, they vary from month to month. But uh, then Robert can talk to you a bit about the, the immediate impact then in terms of the operational issues on his side of the house. Okay. So from my staff, um, to operate 24-7 in Belfast and Larne, uh, we estimate I need 25 vets, 75 portal inspectors, and 12 admin staff to do those documentary checks that we talked about. In addition to that, um, the local authorities uh, estimate they'll require 30 additional EHOs. Some of that will be for export work, uh, and we'll need about 18 plant officers and three fish. The local authorities have made good progress, and most of their staff, their environmental health officers, and the additional plant and fish inspectors are already in place. So my own staff, 25 vets I need. Um, we've just recruited 14 um, new vets, new veterinary inspectors, and nine of those are going directly into the port. I already have six there, which brings me to the 15. And what we're doing for the rest of the veterinary resource is we will move others, some others, directly into, the, into the, the port. But we're going to cover, we're training 53 vets across the department in total. Um, 53 of those are through their first phase of training. There's three or four phases to the training. Uh, one of which is being provided by the, the, the European Union for free. Um, so, actually, when it comes down to the number of vets pulled out of the field, when you divide it across the 10 divisions, it's manageable. The 75 portal inspectors, I have 10 portal inspectors, I have 10 um, Group 1 staff available from uh, um, the end of the brucellosis programme. Um, one of our successes is the eradication of brucellosis from Northern Ireland. The end of the surveillance programme has come to an end, and that frees 10 um, port, uh, to, uh, Group 1s who can redeploy to the port immediately. Um, we also have a recruitment campaign there. There's 14 are coming off the, uh, that recruitment campaign, <coughs> and those are coming in at the moment. And then the others will have to come from across the service. Um, I have around 160, 170 um, Group 1 officers and which to pull from. Some of those will be permanently uh, located at the port. Some will, some will uh, do it on a part-time basis and provide cover. Um, this is such an important thing, Chair, that um, Dr. McNamee, my deputy, this is her main effort uh, at the moment. This is what she's concentrating on, as well as little things like beef to US and keeping Hong Kong market open and other small issues like that. But Petra is, is concentrating on this and making sure that people are in place and properly trained, working closely with the trade union side in order to ensure that this is done as painlessly as possible. Moving staff is one of the most difficult things I do. Um, staff generally like to work where they're working. Um, so Petya is working through this um, uh, as, as quietly and as conscientiously as we can do in working with the trade union side to, uh, to try and avoid as much disruption to staff as we can. But as far as the work is concerned, yes, we're busy. Um, yes, um, animal health keeps giving, as you're aware, even influ um, influenza outbreak and GB at the moment, uh, probably coming our way just to add to our, our, uh, our woes. Um, but I'm confident we can maintain the services that we're doing at the moment. And uh, 
and I have to thank the staff publicly for their for their efforts. Thank you. Move right around, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation to us today. A couple of issues. Uh, in relation to checks, in relation to uh, the problems you're going to have at the, at the sea, can, is, can you see any... Um, will rules be re rigid the first morning, or will there be a degree of flexibility to let things bed in? I think, that, yeah. to me, that would be important. I'm not sure whether or not that is do doable or not. Um, that would be my first question, because I think if there's not a degree of some sort of flexibility, it's going to be quite difficult if there's issues in the first morning. Um, the other issue would be in relation to unfettered access, just exactly we're still not sure exactly where, what unfettered, well, we hope we know what unfettered access means, but do we? Uh, and the other one is, uh, I have a constituent that imports large quantities of wear potatoes. I know seed potatoes and wear potatoes, we're told, will be not be allowed to be imported into Northern Ireland as things stand. This is a major issue because, I mean, I have a constituent that imports probably several thousand tonnes of wear potatoes from East England and supplies all the local chip shops both north and south of the border. Uh, just wonder where we stand with that, or is you know I know there's negotiations still going on, but to me that would seem a travesty. That would seem a very serious issue. This if it wasn't resolved. Uh, so m maybe just on the last point, what I'll do is uh, just to say the minister has actually written to his counterparts about this. Um, he has some very serious concerns about this. Uh, this is due to the listing process um, for um, you know uh, for goods coming across from GB to, into the EU and. Uh, uh, what's going to happen or into Northern Ireland and then on into the EU potentially. So what is, uh, what's, what's happening at the minute is um, we're working very closely with GEFRA to see what can be done about this uh, to accelerate the process. Um, but I have to say um, there, there may be some gap after the 1st of January uh, in getting that listing in place. So that's what the, why the Minister is concerned. So it will be very important um, to, for us to, and I'm, I'm glad of the opportunity to, to um, say that today, because it'll be important for our colleagues in the business community to do whatever they can to mitigate for that hopefully short gap, but nevertheless, it's not entirely within our control. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, yeah. And I just, I don't know, Norman, if you want to add anything on that, and then maybe more go on to into unfettered access. Add, and I, I should always say, I always say add and correct if I've got anything wrong. Go yeah. ahead, Norman. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's uh, absolutely right, uh, Dennis, around uh, businesses just not need to do a bit of contingency planning uh, on the basis that there, there could well be a gap here um, and, and, uh, and, and build out their plans. On, on fettered access, I mean, uh, as you know, the, uh, the objective here is to ensure that uh, you know, trade from Northern Ireland, direct trade from Northern Ireland to GB can continue as is. Uh, so the components to allow that to happen I suppose we, there's three, uh, and as Dennis says, they're sort of at a, at a policy level. Uh, so the first one is the Internal Market Bill, uh, and that you know, establishes the principle of mutual recognition, uh, because we will be operating uh, under a EU standard, uh, rather than a GB standard, so that's an important aspect of it. Secondly is non-discrimination, uh, so that prohibits any additional checks, controls on, on products uh, moving from Northern Ireland to the rest of the uh, UK. So that's set out in the, in the Internal Market Bill. Second component then is around a definition of well, what's, what's the qualifying good uh, definition. Uh, and so we now have that uh, within a piece of subordinate legislation. Uh, so it's any good present in Northern Ireland or any good that has undergone processing operations in, in Northern Ireland um, and incorporating domestic goods or goods not under uh, customs supervision. So that's the second component. So we now have a, a definition of what a qualifying good is. The third component we haven't yet uh, seen is the anti-avoidance uh, measures uh, to prevent any unjustified goods uh, through Northern Ireland. So that's the third bit that still has to come, and we have not have line of sight on that one. But those three together effectively create then uh, the unfettered access arrangements. Um, and uh, I suppose at this stage, 
uh, particularly around the definition of qualifying good. Uh, that's a, as they described, it's it's a bridge uh, to a longer term uh, arrangement. Um, and so thoughts are now turning to what that longer term arrangement would be uh, that would work, particularly for agri-food, uh, and to address some of the concerns that they would have uh, in all of this. So that's very much uh, under active consideration uh, at this point in time. And then if maybe just hand across to Robert. I mean, the yeah. one thing I will say in handing across to Robert is uh, this kind of relates to the previous um, discussion we had around this, because obviously what we're doing has, is set out in domestic law. So um, in that context, Robert will talk about how, how we would hope to, to deal with this. Um, we could only have got as far as we have got um, through the working with the EU Commission. Um, myself and CBO UK uh, went and had face-to-face -face discussions with the senior veterinary team within the Commission in Brussels. And they worked hard to find flexibilities and clarification within the existing legislation uh, in order to uh, help us with a plan that was deliverable. And we wouldn't have got to where we are with a deliverable plan that I can present to you with some confidence if the Commission hadn't helped us with that and um, permitted some flexibilities within the legislation. Not new legislation, but pointing out to us things like the seal check instead of an identity check, things like the ability to do remote documentary checks. Um, that came directly from help from the Commission. So, day one, what will it look like? Whenever we have the legislative framework and we know exactly what we're doing, then part of what I do in my enforcement role is that we produce a compliance protocol. So that will lay out day one for my staff exactly what they're supposed to do within the legal, the legal framework and what they can do and what they can't do. And that will be shared publicly so that importers will know exactly what to, what to expect. And that's where the flexibility will come, William. It will come within that um, compliance framework. Um, that may mean that there isn't full compliance achievable on day one, but it will set the path of phased introduction towards full compliance. And that's important because that's what the Commission will expect. Because remember, what all this is about is trying to protect the SPS, the plant health, animal health and public health integrity of the single market of the island of Ireland. That, that's really what this is about, and it's to achieve that. So my compliance protocol will have to be very similar to that in Dublin, and I'll be working with colleagues in Dublin to try and achieve that. Otherwise, quite simply, goods will go whichever is the easiest route, uh, and, that, and that just makes a nonsense of the, the overall principle we're trying to apply, which is to try and protect the, um, the island of Ireland, albeit from a very low threat from GB. Just I can see difficulties on day one, that, 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 or, or even the first week or two, you know, whereby I would have thought there needed some sort of flexibility, kind of a nightmare situation. Yeah. You're trying to negotiate, William. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Fab. Thanks, uh, Chair. <clears throat> so, just so I have this right, so there will be DERA officials at Liverpool and Karen Ryan to at the initial point of. I mean, there's no issues. There, I mean, there's no issues with that. I should say, DERA authorised officials. So we, we're we're sorting that out at the minute, and we're looking at a number of options. But uh, either it'll be DERA officials. Robert can talk about it, or we've other options but that we're looking I just, at. I just I just do it now. Um, there is an uh, there is an option under Article 73 to do this sort of thing in the official control regulations, but it doesn't really apply properly in this place. So what we'll be doing is either authorising. Um, staff of APHA, perhaps the customs, or perhaps even of the operator to act as officers of the department. So I don't need to physically put my staff with all the HR and difficulties with that into the ports. We will if we have to. Uh, and we might have to put a few over to start with to sort out problems and issues. But that should be done on the end of the phone. Who, who will they be accountable to? A me. Okay. General Rule Philip, it's my fault. <laughs> okay. I mean, the other th issue then is. The, the, there has been talk of EU officials then being present here at the port to check all of this. I mean, has there been any movement in relation to that? That's not uh, that's not a requirement, actually. I, that, I, I haven't heard that anywhere, Philip, except Tony Connolly. Okay, Tony's genuine. He's genuinely right, right yeah. but um, 
I have in my discussions with the Commission um, at a technical level, they don't know. Uh, they don't know about it. Okay. Uh, in terms of IT, then, I mean, is there, there there's going to have to be obviously sharing of information between uh, you know the British system and the EU system. I mean, ha is that been developed or is that? Yes, I, th I th touched on that in my yeah, notes, and again, maybe Robert, you might want to elaborate on that, or Mark actually might wish to as well. So, uh, if you know the difficult bit, Philip, uh, interaction between systems is is one of the most difficult things you can do in ICT, and there are lots of systems here. What I've been assured of just last night is that my end, so that for these inspectors working in GB, they will have a handheld, be that an iPad or other ruggerized device, that will allow them to pull up the export health certificates and interrogate it, be able to check off the seal while standing in the cold and wind at the side of the port. Um, so that's the important part. It's the, it's, it's the interaction between my, my system uh, and, and the traces system or should I say Mark system and the Traces system, that's the EU system, in order to do the checks electronically online, and that is, is on, on schedule for delivery, in fact, delivery in December before that happens. On, on, the, other, on the other side, um, well, those are really for the exporter um, to put those systems in place where their own control systems, which allows the exporting health, uh, certification officer to have the traceability in the product which allows them to raise the export health certificate, which as Dennis has said is key to this, in order to put that onto the trace system. And uh, that's one of the key things to this is that the Commission have, have clarified that GB will have access to traces as an exporting country. It looked for some time that wasn't going to happen. They realise it needs to happen now. So GB will have access to traces as an exporting country. Northern Ireland will have full access to traces as an EU entity. Just one, one thing, just to clarify, it may well be, I'm just thinking in the OCR, there's, you know, the way there's very specific um, requirements around buildings and so on. Yes. So it may be that there's that there's something in there that says, you know, there'll be space to allow officials to come along and look to check that our systems are in place, but there's never been any suggestion about um, EU officials checking, uh, you know, actually doing the checking. So, you know, obviously we will be in close communication with the EU who are going to approve these points of entry. Um, we need them to approve, um, but that's, uh, but, but not, not to do the actual checking. So just, just so to be clear about that, it's not to say there won't be anybody um, from the Commission will ever want to, you know, we, we, clearly people will need to come and have a look at the facilities to make yeah. sure that they're compliant. Okay, fair enough. Uh, yep. Right, Philip. Um, Apatze? Can you hear me, Patsy? Yeah, Chair. Go ahead, Patsy. Are we getting clear there? Okay. Uh, thanks very much to Dennis and the, the, uh, his, his other team members there for their, their presentation and keeping us in so far as they, they can with the constraints that they're under, but with the external factors. Uh, could, could I just ask, um, we, we, we were talking there about the, the build and the plan permissions, and thankfully there, Permitted development and CLUD rights have been established for the the various projects, the points of entry at the ports. Um, now, Dennis, you mentioned there the potential for the contractor. You mentioned you would be talking uh, around about November time, uh, sometime in November for a preliminary meeting with the contractor. Uh, has the, the contract then has been presumably sealed and delivered? Yes. Sorry, yes. Sorry, I, maybe just to clarify that, uh, that's a, a helpful. It's helpful you've raised that. No, I, uh, what I what I meant to get across, which I maybe didn't, was we've obviously been in detailed conversations, uh, discussions with the contractors. The contractors have been appointed, um, and what we've done, what we've been doing is um, they're they're coming up with a detailed set of plans and schedules, work schedules, and they're to be with us by the sixteenth of November for the full model. But in the meantime, we've been working with them more immediately to have the contingency arrangements in place. So they're also doing a bit of they're doing a bit of work on those facilities that, that I, I mentioned at the different ports that'll be used for contingency purposes, and they will do that work. So that's what I, I suppose what I meant to get across was by the 16th we'll have detailed schedules for the full model. But in the meantime, we are already we already have um, detailed planning work has been done and we've got the plans ready for 
uh, the contingency arrangements. And Mark will be happy to provide a bit of additional information on that, if that's helpful to you, Hansi, just because he's, he's, he's in direct conversations with them. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Mark. I don't know if he can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Patsy. Yep, just to give you a bit of a flavour for that. So we're working across all the three major sites uh, and, 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 and actually including FOIL, so Lauren, Warren Point and, and Belfast. So we're taking forward two parallel processes. The uh, contracts for award were, were awarded to each of the, the big uh, players on the 7th of October. Uh, and we immediately had uh, detailed conversations with them around the two parallel processes. So on the full design, um, which they've spent the last two to three weeks pulling together in line with Robert's teams and, and the other users on the sites. And more importantly, the contingency plans, um, because I set them a date of the 11th of December, they have contingency facilities at all the ports in place. So they've been very much focused on that. And if you can imagine, we're running pell-mell to get the designs in place, get them agreed internally, get them drawn up by the contractors, making sure we can get access to the ports and carry out the relevant environmental permission assessments and planning assessments as well for the contingency plans. So that has taken up the last two to three weeks of time. And on Monday, we got permission to push the button to start that contingency work. So the contractors are out on the three major sites as we speak, measuring up, fitting up, and putting in the orders for the temporary buildings. But I've also asked them to work at pace um, to bring together the full designs, and we hope to have those full designs by the 16th of November. Um, for the, for initial discussions, um, but we have had a lot of discussions already on those, uh, and that will set aside the timeframes for the full design and the full build program, which I'll bring to you as quickly as, as I can. I, I think, Mark, you probably answered what I was going to ask, and that is it's a design and build by the contractor. Yes. Yes. Um, we, we we were we tried to remain agile at the very early stages because we thought um, and we knew um, from having done previous projects that we wouldn't get the the significant facilities built on time. So we awarded the procurement contract to use the the actual contractors. So there's one contractor for each port to design and build the contingency as well. So as they would become familiar with the team, familiar with the port, and then get on quickly to do both jobs. Okay. Right. That, that brings me on to my next question then is, um, number one is the projected cost of the scheme in uh, an agreement scenario. And the B is the, the second one is the projected cost under a no deal scenario. Um, what, what are the costs of each of the individual schemes at, at the three ports? Mark, do you want to come in on that? I, I, I have figures, but to be honest, they change a bit. The one thing I will say, just, and I'm glad you asked the question, because um, in terms of the contingency arrangements, it's just worth saying, um, Mark, Mark indicated we just got approval on Monday, so we got approval for an additional £5 million for the contingency arrangements. That's across the three mm -hmm. sites. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that broken down yet by site, but we can, we can get that. Um, or I don't have it sorry, in front of me, but we can get that if necessary, as necessary. Um, Mark, do you want to just uh, tell us what the current position on the full model, as best you can, is, given that this is a, a, a moving picture? Go ahead, Mark. I see the, the full cost across each of the each of the four sites for the bills about thirty thirty eight point three million. Um, I can write you a note on the specifics of what it would cost um, for each of the sites. I just can't remember those figures. They they come in and out of my head. Um, and for the for the uh, contingency planning, as Dennis said, it's five million pounds all in for the contingency planning. So that will give you an idea idea of the significance. For example, um, it's it's in and around one million pounds for Warren Point um, to build the contingency facility. So they're they're by no means tents or, or bits of shed. They are substantial infrastructure. Well, sorry, maybe, but I can maybe, maybe the, get you the full details of those in time. Yeah, I was going to say, if you're happy enough, we'll follow up in, in writing. Very, very happy to do so, um, just to make sure that we're giving you the correct figures. To be fair, at, at, um, there's so much happening around this that uh, it, they will change. But I think at a point in time, it'd be helpful for you to have the have the uh, the correct figures. Now, uh, the second part of a good chair, just uh, for yourself there, Dennis, and I noticed that you're, you're having... Um, a number of engagements and uh, information sessions for external stakeholders on the lakes. Um, uh, the first question I'd be asking is what shape and form that will take specifically for businesses. And secondly, um, I'm getting quite a few queries from businesses about 
what what's going to happen with with HMRC, um, what sorts of things can they anticipate from them? So, is it the case that you would be involved in HMRC in those uh, stakeholder engagements and information sessions that, that you intend to host? That that would that would be our intention. Um, I should say um, that what one of the one of the characteristics of this is we're doing the SPS elements, but there's a much yes. wider piece of work involving HMRC and um, and Border Force and other agencies who are based at, are already based at the ports but who are doing um, but who, who need to change how they operate so we um, so basically that the, and there's a lot of different forums um, for uh, businesses and I know invest and I's been doing things and and the yeah. Department for economy um, so what we're what we're doing is in a way I for six, we're going to set. We're going to hold some webinars, and the intention is to involve HMRC, um, okay. and, but we're just organising that at the minute. Um, the idea behind that is, I'm I, the objective in a way, um, and it sounds silly, but if they all mm -hmm. turn around and say, "You've told us everything that we already knew already," while that wouldn't be ideal, that would at least mean that we've, you know, that we're we're communicating because even there will be questions we won't be able to answer. Um, because they're not, they're not in our control to answer because we just don't have the answers. They're not, they're, you know, their they're issues coming out of the negotiations. But my view is, at the very least, if we can come out of that and say, here's a set of questions from the pers perspective of individual businesses, and it may well be things that we're not seeing or not, you know, realising, oh, my goodness, there's a big issue there, um, then... That the idea behind that will that will help to kind of us to refine our plans, but it'll also mean we can do a Q and A brief, and get those answers as quickly as we can and put them out publicly, because I think the sooner the the, the frustrating thing about this is the fact that um, and and it's nobody's fault, it's just the nature of a negotiation process, but the frustrating thing for us coming to the end of this negotiation process is we have to get it ready and we have to get businesses ready, and how can we do that if we can't give them answers? So um, the sooner that's so, so at least even if we have a conversation where we say here's at least you know that we're telling you everything we know, and uh, and then we can we can get their questions and hopefully get answers if, even if we can't answer them get them from our colleagues and uh, as they come out of the negotiations, um, but that's 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 that the, the intention really at the minute is a webex type event and um, it'll it'll be there uh, and it'll be simply a case of some short presentations. Um, and actually a Q and a, a Q and a session, and people can even if we can't answer the questions at the time, we'll take them with us and we'll we'll do up a brief. Dan, Dan, oh, sorry, did you, worth, sorry, no, go ahead. Might, might just be worth uh, mentioning. Uh, there's a very comprehensive trader support service uh, yes. has been put in place, um, and I know that the uptake on that has not been as good as it could be. Uh, so I think it's important that uh, individual businesses do sign up to that service and that will provide them with very practical uh, and direct support uh, to meet the, the requirements. So I think you know, that's, that's a, a strong message needs to go out that, that businesses need to engage with that service. Um, and uh, you say it's, it's, it's a very comprehensive service. Uh, a lot of uh, resources have been put into it from, from the government. Um, and businesses do need to, to sign up to that. Sorry, that's a really important point, and I, so I, I should have said that. And in a way, so what I was talking about was our session is really a fail-safe to say, well, look, if there's questions you're not getting answers to, at least we're, we'll we'll take them on board. So in a way, it's in addition to all of that, and I, and that's why I'm saying, if ideally, if they say, well, do you know what, you're not telling us anything we can't get from anywhere else, that'll be success for me in one way because it'll mean that some of these other mechanisms are working the way they need to. But it's really just to get an idea of where people are. Sorry, thank you for that, Norman. Sorry, Patsy. Right. Uh, you, the, that trader support service is this one uh, that the department itself, or is it Invest NI, or no. where, where's that one at? Oh, it's it's actually HMRC. Uh, HMRC. All right. Oh, okay. It's, 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 it's online. Yeah. So so uh, again, um, the details are there, but we can it'll be online if anybody looks it up. Trader support service, but we can we can certainly happily forward on the, the links to it if that's helpful. Thank okay, you. that'd be great. Okay, thanks very much. Well, uh, just just related before we go around to Harry here, you see the, uh, we said there were 38.3 million as a total cost and there's 5 million contingencies. Dan, can you confirm, see, see that funding, is that, is that, um, is that, is that, all that out, is that money from the Treasury over and above our block grant or is any of that ever a block grant? No, that, 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 should, that is additional money 
uh, which has been approved by the Treasury. For this purpose? For this purpose. And, and I, I should say, one of the things I should say is, when we ask, um, again, one of the reasons why it will be important to write this down is when we're talking about figures like 38, you'll have heard figures, I've used figures previously, 45, what, and that's this year. So there's two elements to the cost. There's obviously a capital cost yeah. and there's a revenue cost. So just, just to be clear about that, so I think what we're referring to there is the capital cost we've yeah. talked about, but we'll, need to, we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you the current breakdown anyway of the Perfect. costs. Uh, uh, Harry? Okay, thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> Robert? Um, you talked about selling approved officials over to Liverpool, Kern Ryan, maybe. Um, were your thoughts of employing someone here, sending staff that you already have, or do you think it would be more efficient? To, have you looked at employing out there? What are your thoughts? Send, sending my own staff is actually, Harry, my last, my last option. Last option. My preferred option is to um, employ or to designate APHA staff my equivalent service in GB. Um, but strangely enough, it depends on the unfettered access part, because it may be that if unfettered access is what we'd all like, then there'll be no need for any SPS, APHA staff. So if they're not there, I can't use them. And that then brings me down, I'd quite like to use Border Force, because they are officials and, and used to having to ensure compliance. Uh, and then there's the opportunity, perhaps, to use the 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 actual the the P and O standards of this world to do it for me. So we're still at the stage of um, of investigating all that because the the difficulty is I don't know the quantum of the checks. I don't know how many uh, containers with EHCs are coming, and so I don't know how you know what the pattern of checks will be. Now we're getting closer to having solid figures on that. Um, so the discussions are, are starting, and in fact, uh, Dennis has asked for a paper on that, and we're expecting that this week. Yeah. So it's it's a moving it's a moving feast, Harry. But actually, putting my own staff over there is a last resort. And what I do think probably will has to happen is that I'll have to put uh, a couple of vets over, you know, at the very beginning in order to sort out teething difficulties and to sol solve problems and make decisions. But then we're all used to working remotely now. You know, so why would you physically put somebody on the ground when they can be in the end of a screen? Why, why do we want to, I mean, use your staff and employ from here? It would be cost, wouldn't be very cost effective. It would be either. a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, right. Chair. I mean, ju just it's worth, it's, uh, it's just to add to it, to say one of the, it, there's been a lot of challenges with the process and getting some of these facilitations in place, and the Minister's been absolutely clear about needing, and it, to be fair, I think that's something that's shared by everybody, uh, the point of needing to make this as streamlined as we possibly can, uh, because this is potentially damaging to businesses and to consumers if we don't. But one of the things um, that it has, it has really encouraged us um, to, to look at all of these ideas in a different way. You know, it's really pushed us. Um, it would have been too easy to say, well, OK, here's, this is how the rules apply and that's it. But the rules are, are written in such a way that there are flexibilities built into them, and we need to use those uh, to the very best of our ability. So it's just a good example of where we're trying to do that. OK. Right. Thank Hi. You. Yep, I'm fine. Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, um, this unfettered market access... This is, I think, it's causing major problems. I've had uh, representation from several nurseries, plant nurseries, in relation, in relation to this. They're getting their baby plants from mm. South of England. They're coming, coming across. And they are really, really concerned about the documentation and paper, paperwork that has to be completed. These plants, they're... They're very, they're very tiny plants. They have a very limited shelf life. They don't want to be sitting at a port for a couple of days on end to be brought across. They can't afford that. So is there any reassurance you can give to people like that? I know we spoke about it in relation to seed potatoes, but these are these also, this is a major, major problem also. And then the other side of it is, there's still no indication how checks will be carried out in relation to Republic of Ireland goods travelling through Northern Ireland and into GB. We have both East, West and North, South there. Okay. So I'm wondering, you. could you give me some, give me some details? Okay. Well, um, 
I don't know, Robert, if you can touch on some of the, the issues around plants from your SPS work no, or... A, but, Rosemary, thanks for that. And I put out a general call and I may regret it. But individual issues like that, make sure we know about it. You know, yesterday's was hatching eggs are not considered animals. They're just, required, they're just considered as goods. So they wouldn't be prioritised. Now, I think hatching eggs should be prioritised. So I'm trying to deal and work my way through that. But it's in this minutiae, uh, Rosemary, that our biggest problems will come. So the plants will be a similar one, and those little plugs you're talking about that dry out very quickly yes. is, is, is a particular issue. So it's, it's something that within the SPS family uh, of checks, that if we know about these things, they can, in some way or other, we will find a way to pri prioritise them. But so you're you know, bringing things like that forward to your constituencies is far from a waste of time. In fact, I welcome that stuff so that we know um, the things that need to be prioritised. Now, we have a fair good idea ourselves but that doesn't mean that uh, I might miss something if you don't tell me. So tell me. And it um, might be helpful. It might be helpful for us then to give you some more detail on what what the certification and the processes will look like. Um, you know, in writing. If you're happy enough, we can follow up on that. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh -huh. and then your other point was about unfettered access yes. and ROI goods. So Norman, do you want to touch on this? Yeah. So this is goods moving in the in the opposite direction. Yes. So, uh, so yeah, uh, obviously that's uh, part of the. Uh, the three measures that I talked about, so it's really taking you through to the anti-avoidance uh, measures. Yeah. So basically, unfettered access is for Northern Ireland businesses and Northern Ireland goods. Um, and so uh, there has to be then a mechanism to ensure that uh, there is not uh, rerouting of goods for unjustified reasons uh, or for the purpose of avoiding uh, input formalities. Uh, and that's where the anti-avoidance measures uh, will, 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 will seek to, to address and prevent that. Uh, but what we don't have sight of yet is what they will look like. Yeah. When will you get sight of them? They are to be in place before the end of the year. Um, and, uh, but uh, I think we originally expected them to be in the finance bill, uh, but we have not yet seen them. But they do need to be in place before the end of the calendar. Okay. So it's a great example of where we need to get, where we need, the, this is the information <laughs> that we need as well. Um, and one other, if Chair, if yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh -huh. um, You spoke, uh, Dennis, when you were you, sp you spoke earlier earlier on about the, um, you were looking. You, you said you have not had sight of Dara plans yet. Uh, sorry, if I said Dara, I'm not Dara. Yes, yes. Apologies, yeah. Dara for plans yet. Does does that? You're meant to be working together. You're meant to be cooperating together. Is that not uh, disturbing? And um, surely that's not helpful. Surely you need to be getting sight of seeing what they are doing. And can you comment? Yes, I, I, th I think all, all I would say is that we do have a really good working relationship with uh, DEFRA. And you've almost said, almost said Dara. Yeah. <laughs> we have a really good rela working relationship with DEFRA. Um, we have a very open working relationship with them. Um, and I think, but on this particular issue, we, we need some more information. And uh, I think, um, and, and, and to be fair, there, there are bigger uh, political issues around this and bigger negotiation issues around this. Um, because obviously, um, you know, they're, they're, they're working hard at the minute. And I, I will say this is not, not an easy position for DEFRA to be in either, and for officials in DEFRA to be in. Um, because there's there's a lot of work going on in the negotiations, and they have been good at involving us. But on this particular issue, the problem is if we don't know exactly how many certs are going to be coming across to us, and if we're if businesses are not ready enough, then that's a challenge. And in fairness, it reflects. If you remember, prior to the resumption assembly, we had some meetings where we talked about under the previous arrangements in 2019. We were having to prepare the certificates, yes. and there was headlines at that time about 1.9 million certificates. Um, so they're they're now dealing with the same kind of scale of issue that we were at that stage, um, because they ha those certificates have to be prepared. So um, I, 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 I I wouldn't want to criticise colleagues in DEFRA because they have been really good with us, uh, but I will say that the sooner we have clarity about what, and the sooner businesses are clear about what they need to do. I think the better, and and that's that needs to come out of the negotiations, and it needs to come out quickly. Okay, okay. okay Rosemary. Yep. Uh, 
Uh, Claire? Claire? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, and thank you for the briefing and um, for all the work that you're doing as well. I think it's, you've made it very obvious um, the pressures that you're under um, and, again, the lack of clarity and how that's hindering moving forward. But I suppose um, I wanted to think, I, I know when we got an update from um, the harbours of a while back, there were concerns raised, um, and I think you've addressed a lot of them, um, but particularly with um, a backlog in Carn Ryan um, coming here. So I'm just wondering if any works to date have made you feel any better or is it any concern to yourselves that you know um vehicles coming via conran to northern ireland um that the potential for backup has been um dealt with in terms of the the volume being dealt with there but i'm looking also at your written briefing here and just noting that um both scottish and welsh governments have um recommended that they have withheld consent for the internal market bill um, and that there's no further update from there at this stage. But I'm wondering how does that impact, um, if anything, for us going forward or for yourselves and the work that you're doing? Um, and um, the last one, I suppose, is the trade negotiations around fisheries. Um, and it's saying here that there's a, a proposal to include a three-year transition period to allow the EU fishing industry time to prepare um, for the new allocation of quotas. And if there's any update on the impacts or um, any agreements for the sector here. Okay, so um, I'm just thinking in terms of Conrad, it might be worth Robert just okay. talking about that to start with. So Claire, we are planning on the basis of the current um, throughput. In fact, the detailed one I use is a week in September. So that, that's what we're planning on. But until we know what exactly uh, comes out of the full breadth of the, of the agreement, it's hard to know if the current volumes will be reflective of the future ones. But really, for planning purposes, it's the best I can do. Now, Mark and his team are working very closely with the portal authorities. And of course, um, P&O are responsible not just for Larn Port and for the, the boats, but also for Ken Ryan Port. So it's very easy to talk to the you walk talk to one person when you're talking about con concerns about the whole ports, and we're talking more or less constantly with with all of the portal authorities on their concerns. Um, so the the answer to your question is that we are aware of the concerns, but it's difficult to plan at the moment until we know if that might emerge. It may be that we have very few checks. It may be that we have a lot. We're 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 driving down a middle course of a reasonable worst case scenario, which is normally what we plan for. Okay, and, and maybe moving on then to the internal market bill, I don't know, Norman, do you want to, add, is there anything else you can add at this stage around that? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we sort of, uh, I think, covered covered this at uh, our last session uh, with the, uh, the committee. Um, obviously, there, there are some elements within that that we have, would have concerns around, uh, as we discussed. Um, I suppose where it cuts across into devolved responsibilities uh, is, for example, in marketing standards, uh, which is a devolved matter. Um, and the, the, the cut across in terms of mutual recognition, non-discrimination. Uh, so effectively, devolved administrations uh, in, in GB could set uh, marketing standards, uh, but they would have to recognize uh, on a statutory basis different marketing standards that might be set elsewhere. Um, you can't get discriminate, you must uh, recognise. Um, different for us here because we will be operating to EU standards, uh, so therefore we don't have that discretion around marketing standards, uh, and we don't have that, uh, well, uh, we can't operate mutual dis uh, recognition uh, because the only standard we can recognise is the EU standard uh, on product coming into Northern Ireland. So there are complex issues uh, in all of that. Um, and yes, uh, you know, Scotland Wales may well uh, decide to withhold legislative consent, uh, but then that really is an issue then for the UK government in terms of how it uh, responds to that. And, and I suppose in terms of fisheries, there's probably um, it might be better po possibly to follow up. We'll, we'll maybe follow up on that to see if there's anything else to report on it, but we don't have anything at this stage uh, that I'm aware of, Norman, even through the... Um, so we'll, we'll maybe get you an update on that if you're happy enough, Claire. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask just a quick, yeah. hopefully a quick, quick one? So I, I know that you know we can't be ready, and you're telling us very clearly for all eventualities on the the first of January. Um, but this issue about not being able to check all goods in all ports, um, and the potential then for that to impact 
goods coming in or I think that is there a bigger risk of the potential of goods coming in being affected rather than goods leaving Northern Ireland uh, being affected and is there a list of what goods might not be able to come in? Um, yeah, I mean, so yes, yeah, so we, there's a couple of things, I suppose. The fir first thing is that um, the, the issue, the, when we're talking about the arrangements, a lot of the work we've been doing on the physical arrangements and the operational arrangements have been about goods coming into Northern Ireland. Uh, goods going out shouldn't be, uh, um, you know, again, I, I'm afraid to say it, because let's see what the negotiations come up with, but uh, shouldn't be as much of an issue for us. Uh, there will be an issue then for uh, in GB about how they deal with goods whenever they come in, and that's that's a different matter. Um, so that's the first thing. I think um, then I suppose it's important to say that some ports have actually been looking to expand in a way their designations, uh, but the, the issue here is about actually uh, having the ports designated to take in the things that we need them to take in. So Robert can maybe talk about that in a bit more detail um, as to what the operational implications no. of that would be. That's right. And just as an example, um, Lauren currently has facilities for livestock, for cattle, sheep and pigs. Belfast hasn't. Belfast wanted to use this as an opportunity to develop themselves uh, a facility for cattle, sheep and pigs. Well, we'll do that in the full solution, but we'll not do it now. Mm. And you know, the similar when you go down right down through the goods, through horses, through through other other animals, um, where it would be good to have a contingency of having facilities at both ports, but we can get by, by without at first time. I think what Claire's um, thinking about as well is that there are a list of goods under what they call prohibitions and restrictions for which there either isn't an export health certificate or for which um, they, there are other reasons why they can't be imported from a third country, GB, into the European Union. And that's really all I'm going to say about that because it's subject to negotiations. And, um, and the negotiations are actually going on today, so I'm, I can't really say anything more about that. So, I mean, I suppose one thing um, which we don't touch on um, in the middle of this, because I don't often feel like looking around for opportunities in all of this, because at the minute, speaking personally, um, the opportunity to be senior responsible owner has uh, brought with it enough challenges. But what I would say is um, we are business, the, port, the ports as businesses are looking at this as an opportunity as well. And if we can get this right, um, and, and it won't certainly be where we want it to be on day one, but if we can get this right, there are great opportunities in the middle of all of this uh, down the line for Northern Ireland. So we just need to think about how we maximise that. But that's the next challenge is meet our first challenge, our day one issue, get the full facilities up and running. But let's keep one eye to the future because there's opportunities here in the middle of this as well. Maybe, maybe just one thing to, to add in terms of the, the outward traffic. Uh, and we talked about unfettered access, but that relates to direct movements. Uh, so if we have indirect movements uh, from Northern Ireland down to the south, out to Dublin, that actually is not covered uh, under uh, the un unfettered access arrangements uh, that are being put in place. So we estimate, it's very difficult to get a, an accurate number, but we could we estimate around about 25% of agri-food would route through Dublin. Um, and uh, so you know, that, that, that could be uh, a bit of a possibly a diversion of some of that traffic, um, depending on uh, the, the nature of uh, the, the controls that will, uh, will apply through Dublin. And that of itself, itself will depend on the FTA uh, between uh, EU and UK. Um, so there's uh, obviously uncertainty there as well. So you might have a bit of traffic diversion uh, as, a, as a consequence of that. Okay. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, just, just, just want to mention that there, um, Norman. Um, before, we'll go back to William again. Um, one of the issues that has been raised recently, and, um, and I'm just looking for your assessment of it or clarification of it, if you know, um, has been the possibility of our farmers here in the north losing access to 60 uh, FTAs that the EU currently have as a result of, of Brexit. I know this issue has been raised by the. Um, same in Coveney down in, in the south about our farmers in the north here. Do you have any um, assessment of that impact on farmers here in the event that some arrangement isn't reached and we, we will lose that access to those 60 FTAs beyond the EU? 
Mm. It's something, yes, it's uh, very much uh, something that uh, you know we've been aware of for some considerable time. Yeah. Um, it's a particular issue, I think, in, in the dairy sector, uh, because you know, as you know, a third of our raw milk is, is taken down uh, south for processing there. And what you have then effectively is product of mixed origin. Yeah. Uh, and so this is it's as much a problem for uh, the Republic of Ireland as it is for us, uh, because they would have substantial uh, volumes of, of uh, export, uh, which effectively now is of mixed origin, and it's not possible to segregate uh, the, raw, the raw milk within uh, the, the plants. So there, there are possible uh, solutions to that. One, of course, is uh, to actually try to get access to the, the, the EU FTAs uh, for that uh, mixed origin uh, product. Um, but that entails opening up uh, the, uh, the trade agreement uh, that the EU has with the third country. Not always an easy thing to do. Um, some of them may make provision for uh, mixed origin. Um, and there's a few other possibilities as well that we're actively looking at. Uh, there's a, an issue called accounting segregation, um, where basically if the volume of material you're sending out uh, under uh, the uh, uh, the FDA is within the volume of raw milk that you would have sourced from the Republic of Ireland, then that's fine. Uh, so there's a, a way there. And the other mechanism, of course, is uh, the UK itself is obviously trying to replicate uh, those FDAs uh, through continuity uh, arrangements. And through those, uh, can we actually secure uh, a route into those same markets uh, for mixed origin good? So there's a number of possibilities that are all being looked at that uh, possibly off offer a way through uh, in all of this. Most of the challenges, you know, we could be potentially losing access to those 60 FTAs, um, and certainly if there's no deal arrangement reached, and we're only really gaining one FDA through Britain, which is to uh, Japan, which which already had been there anyway through the EU. Have you any assessment on what percentage of our even dairy or agri food processing prod products in general would would make its way to those 60? Uh, yeah, it's, it's very hard to, to get uh, accurate information. Uh, part of the problem is what's called the Rotterdam effect. So it, it, the material may not necessarily route directly from Northern Ireland. Uh, it can go via uh, other, uh, other routes, uh, but also even that raw milk issue. Uh, we, we don't necessarily know where the raw milk is ending up. Yes. Uh, so it's very difficult to, to put an assessment on that. But there's quite a few uh, uh, of those rollover uh, agreements have now been uh, secured by the UK. Still more to go. Um, and uh, so, uh, again, you know, we're in the process of just uh, assessing where we are in all of that. Um, the UK government continues to, to work at these to try and secure as many as possible. Quite a few already have uh, secured are, and are in place. And I suppose, I mean, the final thing to say is uh, that sometimes the difference between operating under the FTA and operating under WTO rules may not be that great in some of these uh, agreements uh, because the importing country in many cases would not actually be applying an import tariff. Uh, so therefore there's not a great deal of difference in practical terms uh, between having the deal and not having the deal. Yeah. So it's, it's a quite a complex picture. Um, um, William, you're looking back in there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to just touch on the potato situation again. I know Dennis did answer the question to the best I'm sure of his ability, but just to make maybe I'm fully aware, I think Dennis, you said that there could be a gap. I think seed potatoes could probably live with a short gap. The wear market is a big market. I mean, literally hundreds of fast food outlets are supplied from the east coast of England. So a gap there would be create a difficulty, a big difficulty. Uh, I have one constituent of mine who's a big importer, actually, and he supplies the, those chippies. So it is a big issue for him, of course. Is the What's Europe doing to try and address this? I, I presume this is a, Europe is the issue on this. Well, we're, we're working through DEFRA on this, obviously, yeah. um, and uh, I mean, I don't know if you want to add anything more in terms of what... 
Yeah, well, I mean, well, you're right. I mean, it's, it's not an issue that's within our gift, uh, yeah. within the gift of the UK government, so it is an issue that needs to be addressed. So you have to have that uh, recognition through a country listing effectively and recognition of equivalence, and there's a process to go through that. It's not linked to the FTA as such. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's separate uh, to that. Uh, one, one would have thought it's no big issue. It's, it creates no disadvantages to Europe, one would have thought, the importation of rare potatoes to Northern Ireland. You know, I, I, some of those may go on down south, of course. You know, but I, I, no, it, it is a potentially big issue, and the Minister has written in very clear terms um, about this, um, reflecting that. Um, so we'll, we, we are working very closely, and we make, we're making sure we're feeding, feeding those representations through. But certainly very happy um, if you think that, uh, that additional uh, detail might be helpful to you on okay. it as well. We could, we could follow up. I'll do well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring Morris in here now. I see his hand up on the screen. Morris? Morris put his hand down now. So he's <laughs> Harry, yeah, come back to Morris if he comes on yeah. again. Thank you, Chair. Oh, oh. oh. Morris, go can ahead. you hear me? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> uh, but uh, thanks for letting me in. Uh, and thanks to the officials for their updates this morning uh, and a query regarding goods travelling to the UK uh, through Northern Ireland. Uh, but that has been cleared up pretty well. But, but thinking ahead, uh, UK are in trade negotiations with America, New Zealand and Australia. Will Northern Ireland be able to avail of these deals or will there be tariffs different to or separate from the rest of the UK as far as imports are concerned? And is there now a mechanism in place to ensure that the high standards of local produce are not under threat from cheaper goods of a lesser quality? Okay, Norman, maybe if you're happy enough to... Yeah, uh, so obviously, uh, I mean, that's uh, one of the key things from our perspective is that if there are opportunities uh, arising from uh, these new trade agreements, uh, that uh, Northern Ireland businesses have full access uh, to those opportunities, uh, absolutely. Um, clearly, we also have defensive interests uh, in all of this, um, and, and you raised the point about uh, food standards, uh, and our minister has been very clear uh, around uh, all that. Um, but he would certainly uh, like to see no diminution at all uh, in terms of the, uh, the food standards that exist uh, within uh, the UK uh, and the standards that imports need to, need to, to make. And I think. Uh, the, the Trade Secretary has uh, made a statement earlier uh, this week, I think it was, uh, just re-emphasising a commitment to that. But also there are, I think, um, um, the Government actually will be proposing an amendment to the, uh, the Agriculture Bill uh, that uh, in future um, where there are um, new trade uh, deals uh, coming forward, that there should be uh, an analysis uh, uh, of, of the impact of that uh, on, uh, if any, on, on food. Uh, standards, so that would be a helpful uh, addition to the uh, the agriculture bill. Um, so yes, uh, obviously, um, any trade deal, uh, there will always be uh, it's a double-edged sword. There will be opportunities, but there always will be threat. There also could be threats as well. And it's getting a, that that appropriate balance uh, struck with, within the deal um, uh, to protect our interests. Hey, Morris. Thanks, Chair. Just one wee point, if possible, with your permission. And as you pick up on a point uh, raised by Robert about the redeployment of vets and the reallocation from, as he called it, the field, uh, does this reinforce the need for a veterinary school here in Northern Ireland to ensure the sustainable supply of suitably qualified vets uh, throughout Northern Ireland and the UK and indeed the Republic of Ireland? Officials often use the phrase, thank you for that question, Morris. Thank you for that question, Morris. <laughs> Yes, of course it does. And I have been in discussions with both Queen's and, and Ulster University on a possibility of a, of a faculty commencing in Northern Ireland. Um, one of, it's been one of the consequences of COVID that those discussions have, have not progressed as I think both sides would have liked them to do, um, basically because the university has been swamped with its own COVID problems um, and, and hasn't been available for discussions. But they, the discussions are reinvigorated, Morris, and I'm hopeful that, having worked and thought about this now for some time, that uh, a faculty may not be that far away now. There, there are real concrete discussions going on. Thank you very much for that, Robert. Thank you, Chair. Okay. 
Okay. Um, all right. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dallas, goods and foods oh. travelling across different jurisdictions is labelling individual label on the pack going to be a, yeah. an issue or what's what can you tell me about Lab, that? labeling is an issue and i'm going to get i'm going to hand you over to norman again because this is a detailed issue and he's got the yeah the um, the uh, this is something that we've been pushing quite hard to get uh, labeling uh, information out uh, to industry uh, i mean there has been um, guidance published uh, but relating to to gb uh, and then the missing bit is uh, for, uh, for for us so hopefully uh, that is imminent uh, and, and will uh, come out there. So yes, uh, I suppose there's a couple of aspects there. Uh, so um, in, in future, um, where there is a requirement to identify the country of origin, yeah. uh, then the label uh, applied by food processors here has to be UK brackets NI. Um, and uh, where product is coming in from GB, uh, the issue there is that uh, because it's coming into the EU regulatory zone uh, from a, a non-EU area, there has to be an address, a name and address on the label for, for a consumer in the, in the EU zone to contact. And that name and address has to be located within the zone. So it has to actually be a Northern Ireland or uh, an EU27 uh, address. So that's a labelling issue uh, that has to be uh, addressed as well and product coming in from, from GB. Um, so uh, hopefully now we're getting uh, we're at a point where there will be um, um, full guidance coming out on that. So it's actually probably a good thing in the end, where if it's good quality, then it can be resourced. Well, or? It's 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 a consumer information issue. It's not yeah. a food safety issue. Okay. Um, so uh, so it, you know we we'll have to look at it in that context. Um, but yeah, uh, obviously it it, it is a, a, a significant issue for food processors. Uh, because they will have probably product in stock uh, mm -hmm. that will have the old label. They will also have labelling stocks uh, that they will wish to run down. Um, and, and it also takes a bit of time to get new labels um, ordered up and, uh, and made available. So there will be a cushion available there till that change can take place? That effectively is uh, sort of the, the discussions that are yep. ongoing. So it's, it's, uh, and I think we're, we're, we will be taking a, a very measured and pragmatic uh, approach. Uh, we want to work, as Robert said, on, uh, uh, on SPS, on this one as well, it's working towards compliance. Okay, thank you. And then, that's, that's a good point to raise, Harry, because this was raised with us by the, the, re the, the NA Retail okay. people, do you remember, at the committee as well, Aidan Conley group. Um, so, so you're, and I know there was a raised concern with us about a month ago now that the deadline for creating this new label had elapsed and may not be ready for yeah. First of January, so would you be so, confident, Norman, that this won't become an issue, an impediment come first of January? Well, I think that's the point you're making, Norman. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's working towards uh, compliance. Uh, it's it's honest endeavour. Uh, so she was raised here at the committee meeting. Yeah. Or? It, yeah, yeah. It's normal practice, and I've been through a couple of these changes of labelling, <coughs> is for a period of grace to be given. Yeah. But until it's given, we can't give you guarantees it'll be given. <laughs> that would be normal normal practice. And just to be aware, it's not just big stamps and carcasses or big labels on, on boxes. It's on the individual retail yeah. pack. Yeah, that's what I mean. So most pack. processors exactly. will have a significant amount of, of stock. Um, um, Rosemary? Yeah, just to continue that and to get my mind clear. So basically, Northern Ireland products, for the time being, will continue to use Origin EU. Um, no, from 1st of January, they will need to, you know, if, if they have to, have to identify, it's not always the case, but where they have to identify the, the origin, it has to be UK brackets NI. It's UK, so not the not origin, EU, right, okay, that's fine. Um, as I have no other members who are looking to ask any questions, you glad to hear? <laughs> um, I want to take the opportunity to... Again, um, thank you very much. Again, very comprehensive briefing, written and oral, and very comprehensive answers to all the questions that have been raised. So that is, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come here this morning. It's, it's very, very relevant, and very, very um, important at this at this juncture. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thanks, thanks for the time.
Before we move on to the next item, um, I, I did I should note at the beginning that John Blair, I want to record John Blair's apologies for something I should have mentioned at the outset of the meeting. Okay, okay um, item six on our agenda here is the um, written briefing, alien and locally absent species. Um, the documents, uh, Agriculture Amendment Regulations 2020, it's on uh, page, um, the SL one's at page 54 to 57, the draft SR58 at 59, explanatory note page 60, the all human rights screening at 61 to 85, rural needs impact at 64, and there is a memo from the clerk at the table papers 3 to 5. The SR will be laid in the assembly under the draft affirmative resolution procedure, and the amendments made by the SR will come into force on implement uh, on implementation period completion day. The Department advises that in 2018 and 2019, a number of statutory instruments were made at Westminster to ensure that domestic legislation could operate in the event of the, the UK left the EU without an agreement. Some of the SIs amended local legislation for which the Department has responsibility. They were taken forward at Westminster to ensure transparency and scrutiny in the absence of fully functioning assembly and are due to come into operation at the end of the transition period. In the area of the aquatic animal health and alien and locally absent species in agriculture, one SI was made, which is the Aquatic Animal Health and Alien Species and Agriculture Amendment NIEU Ex Regulation 19. The provision of this SI, um, this SI uh, relating to alien and locally absent species is still needed because it reflects that the UK is no longer a member state. As amendments contained in the draft SR do not involve a policy change, they are not being subject to public consultation and there's no statutory um, requirement to consult on them. Um, the um, do members have any, any comments that they want to make in relation to this uh, this particular um, regulation. So, um, are we content? To, uh, there, there are officials uh, available here. If anyone wants to raise any issues with them, he's okay or mm -hmm. okay. happy enough. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, are we okay that this SL1 moves to the next legislative stage? Agreed? Content. Thank you. Okay, before we move on to the next item, uh, agenda four. Um, the, the next, the next uh, agenda item uh, on SIEs can I refer members to the memo from Stella at pages 7 to 13. The document provides a summary and some suggested issues for the members to consider. Um, there was a, there is a, uh, okay, so item 7, written briefing, uh, SI DEFRA, CMO 17 reserve, the common organisation of the markets and agriculture products, miscellaneous amendment. EU exit regulations. There's a memo from Stella at page 12 of the table papers and on the food and drink labelling change from the 1st of January at pages 96 to 101 and correspondence from the department at 102 to 108. One advise members that the regulations are a reserved matter and, they, uh, and are for noting only. Further guidance on the labelling of products of animal origin that is to be placed on the local market will be forthcoming in due course. I think the comments from Robin was helpful. Uh, which is connected to this item. Uh, can I suggest that we seek a further written update on the impact of the statute announcement on businesses, given the concerns raised in relation to adjustment to the new requirements and documentation um, required? Um, yep. So, uh, are you okay with that? Yep. Thank you. Uh, written briefing, the Environment Regulations 2020 is a Category 1. And um, it's on pages 110 and 114, and we, we agreed to only to take a written briefing on Category 1 SIs. There's a memo from the clerk at pages uh, 8 and 9 of the table papers with specific information on this SI. And the SI makes minor and technical amendments to legislation in the fields of air, air quality, international trade, mm -hmm. uh, and endangered species, and wild fauna and flora, public health and chemicals. These changes ensure the appropriate functioning of the legislation after the end of the transition period. It also makes minor amendments to domestic secondary legislation, transposing EU environmental law under Section 22 of the European Communities Act and Section 41 of the European Union Withdrawal Agreement. Act 2020 relating to air quality and dangerous species and chemicals. These changes ensure that legislation functions as intended after the end of the implementation period. Okay, um, there's an official on standby if anybody has any questions or anyone to raise about this. Are we okay? 
So we're happy enough that to note this SA and use the agreed form of forgery briefly agreed by the committee. Yep. Okay. Uh, how that? Okay, item eight, nine on your agendas is uh, is the um, written briefing, the hazardous substances and packaging regulation of 2020. It's in pages uh, 116 to 119, and the clerk has kindly provided a, 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 a written briefing at table to page 13 of the table papers. These regulations are a reserved matter and have already been laid in Westminster, <coughs> and so it's for information and noting only. And um, members may wish to particularly note the last paragraph on page 118 that indicates at the end of transition period any local businesses that sells electrical and electronic equipment such as a torch could face additional administrative burdens. And we may want to get, um, I think we may be useful to get an update, a written update on the impact of the SI, SI and local businesses. That mm -hmm. ask. Yep. Okay. Um, item 10, a written briefing, uh, SI chemicals and gen genetically modified organisms, um, regulation 2020, it's a category 2. Uh, there's a memo from the clerk at 10 or 11 of the table papers, correspondence to the department 120 to 123, the draft SRs at 124 to 166, and an explanatory refer memorandum at pages 167 to 179. The department has advised that this is a, a UK-wide SA and its territorial application includes this jurisdiction. Such ministerial uh, consent is required. But the majority of the SA falls within the remit of the Department of the Economy, with some aspects being within the DOJ remit. Only Regulation 7 and Paragraph 5 of the schedule to regulations which, only, which apply to pesticide fees fall within the remit of DERA and are for the committee's consideration. The SI was laid at Westminster on the 15th of October under the draft affirmative procedure but has not yet been made. The consent of the three executive ministers is required, uh, is required before the debate at Westminster. The Common Committee considered the SI at its meeting on the 4th of November and the Justice uh, Committee considered it before the Halloween recess. Um, um, do you want uh, the, the... So we have Tom, Tommy McNamara is available from the very metal farm branch is available uh, if he wants to do a few minutes of an overview of the essay and ask for any questions, um, you wanna, we get, uh, have you any questions you want to um, raise with Tommy or you can't to move it on? You can't to move this on to the next stage? Mm -hmm. So, members content to note and use the agreed form of words as previously agreed? Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, written briefing is a review of the on fee for a review on the fee for uh, for a review of decisions panel hearing for area based scheme. That's pages one eighty one to one eighty eight on your packs. The department proposes to review the cost of the fee for an external independent panel assessment under the department's review of decisions procedure. This is not a review of the role of the external panel panel, it's a review of the fees. The review is a legal requirement as is stipulated in a High Court order. It is proposed that the review will commence on the 16th of November and will last for four weeks. Taking into account that this is a review, four weeks is considered sufficient time given the subject of the review and the final responses are sought from stakeholders by the 14th of December. Um, are members any comments to make on this? Is yeah. It, Rosemary? Sure. <laughs> well, it's not about the fees. Yes. I don't understand what, what I, I find it very difficult. They're talking about the fees and the fees, but and this body of people making a decision, and then the depart, then the department, or turn around and overturn that not decision. Not on board the recommendations. They're not right? taking on board the recommendations. So, where's the sense in having this body? Yeah, I think that's, that's a that's a that's a broad, that's a, that's a broader. I know it's broader, but yeah, yeah. They, would you like to try and get an oral briefing set up? Well, I think we should there? request a briefing on that. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it's a massive issue. You're talking about the independent panels? Yeah. Yes. Right, panels, right, yeah. Yeah. My, my laptop's not bringing up my things or um, yeah. my agenda today, so <laughs> what was wrong with that? The like. external panels, and I think we've all uh, had that I experience. think we've all, we've all come across this, and, uh, and I think there was a judicial review just to month or six weeks ago that is very, very costly for the department. And th that's on what's this been issue. raised here, yeah. yeah. But it's costly on the farmer if it doesn't work out. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, there's very few farmers can do it. Yeah, that's they, what I'm they, saying. It's very few. No one can do this and review the department unless someone, this person, um, obviously must have been financially able yeah. to do it because it's, it's a big, big, could cost you 70, 80, yeah. uh-huh. Not everyone's going to do okay. that. So we can do two things then. One is we can request the department to give us an oral briefing on the external review um, uh, panel. Panels. I mean, and can, uh, can we also get agreement for to get a summary of their, con- their responses to this particular consultation? Probably on, on farm inspections. Uh, I just got a call this morning, and I got one two weeks ago from farmers. There's Twenty thousand farmers get single farm payment. There's probably fifteen thousand they've never got an inspection in their life, but there's men getting inspected every year. Well, that seems very unfair. I mean, uh, an inspection is no issue, but if you seem to be the person is getting them all the time. Uh, you're in the five percent. Yeah, you're in the five percent all the time. It's not very fair for those people, and I think yeah. I think that needs looked at. I mean, Singapore basic farm payment or single farm payments commenced in two thousand and five. So that's fifteen years. I would say three quarters of the farms never had an inspection. I have no issue with that, but I mean, why pick on some small number of people? Aye, uh, aye. There, there, there seems to be a recording theme of the same people within the five percent. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Fair point. Do you and want to I, get a, a, an oral briefing on that too, will you? A written, a written briefing, just on the end. Written briefing to begin with? Written briefing to begin with? Yeah. Yeah. Fine, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. An oral on the independent panel. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Tell us okay. the computer kicks them out, but I... No, I'll have, a, I'll have a chat with you after. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so item 12 on your agenda is correspondence. Uh, that's at page 201 to 512. Um, there are a number of, there's quite a bit of correspondence, but there's a couple of items I want to draw your attention to. There's a joint industry letter from the LMC, UFU and EMEA to the Minister, and it's been copied to the committee at page 216 to 218 alongside a research report at pages 219 to 356. It's in connection with support measures for sector beef and sheep sectors, given the downward trend in numbers. Members can tend to ask to be copied into the Minister's response and to organise an oral evidence session with these groups on the future agriculture framework in due course. I think that would be very important. They're big key stakeholders. Okay. Uh, Committee on the Administration of Justice regarding the Citizens' Rights Frontier Workers, EU Exit uh, Regulation 2020, is page 478 to 481, highlights what, that the regulations will implement duties under the withdrawal agreement by creating a Frontier Workers Scheme in the UK, which will have a significant impact here, particularly in the border regions. It would be okay if we ask the Department for a written briefing on this and forward it to the TEO and the Economy Committee? Yep, major that issue. Yeah. That issue was raised, wasn't that issue was raised by the, wasn't it the port, the, the Warren Point port people raised it? There was, there was workers from Poland and the ships, which this mm-hmm. became an issue. Mm-hmm. Okay, correspondence from the Department regarding issues raised at the meeting on the 17th of uh, September are in the common frameworks. Um, this useful information provides some idea of the future workload of the committee. Uh, there's correspondence from the department regarding issues raised at the meeting on the 1st of October, page 509, clarification where the responsibility lies for shared environmental services and details of the senior staff, staff structure within the department, which is vital that members should A, either make contact through the private office rather than contact officials directly, or B, through the DLO if they query it, it's information provided for a committee meeting. A member intent that we write to the Mid and East Antrim Council to request information on shared environmental services? Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, I, 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 I've got it all wrong. I was under the impression that SES was set up by the Environment Agency, um, but then obviously maybe they just have a, a management role in setting that up, but yes, I'm content to write to the Middle East Antrim for that info, but it's getting a wee bit confusing in my head. Okay, so we're content to action the correspondence suggested then text sheets on page 191 to 199. Okay, so in terms of the forward work programme, uh, it's on page 514 to 521, and further to our discussion the 22nd of October, the committee requested oral evidence on a number of major strategies and policies. I can now confirm that the environment strategy and green growth is scheduled for the 12th of November. The future agriculture policy is scheduled for the 19th of November. And that's also uh, scheduled that date is oral evidence on animal health and zootechnics common frameworks. 
Costella is working with dear officials to schedule the remaining sessions on the future rural development rural affairs strategy, revised TB strategy, fisheries and waste. DERA have also been informed that the committee are not content that it is consistently providing the papers for committee meetings late or not at all, and DERA have, made a, have been made aware that this meeting scheduling, this made scheduling and timing of meetings difficult. Um, are we, are we con members content that we re-emphasise and remind DERA that the papers for oral briefings should be provided uh, to the agreed timeframes? Yeah. Okay. Members, can I further suggest that as we approach the end of 2020 and the beginning of the new year, that it might be appropriate to arrange an evidence session with the Minister on EU exit and his strategy, strategic priorities moving forward. Um, are we content for Stella to liaise with DERA to schedule such a briefing? Okay. And I want to remember that we have a workshop tomorrow uh, via Starley from 9 o'clock to 10 on uh, effective questioning. Okay. Are we okay for uh, members okay that forward work, work program as outlined? Yes. Um, okay, M13, any other business? Do any members have anything they want to raise on the NLR business? Yeah. Yes, Claire? Go for yes, it. Um, during question time, the Minister on Tuesday there referred to a discussion document on climate change. Um, and I'm wondering if it would be worth asking if the committee could see that document. To contact Dara yeah. and ask for a sight of the document. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Claire. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, the, the next meeting will take place this day week, the 12th of November at 10 a.m. in this very room in Parliament Building. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.